Well, good morning. Welcome back again. This morning we'll be in Psalm number 83, if you'd like to open your Bibles and find that particular song. Psalm number 83. Now, in the last edition, when we spoke of Psalm 82, I mentioned in passing the idea of imprecatory prayers. In fact, imprecatory prayers are a type of psalm. There are a number of psalms in the book of Psalms that are imprecations. In this particular genre, the author or the people singing are crying out to God, asking him to intervene on their behalf between them and their enemies, and more specifically even, praying that they would be defeated, that God would destroy their enemy. There's one infamous one of these psalms later on that talks about asking God to take up the children of their enemies and dashing the babies on the rocks. People are shocked when they read these sort of things. They can't imagine such evil violence being in the Bible, or why would you ask God to do that? One of the things about this genre that you need to notice, we mentioned a little bit the other day, it's certainly going to be clear here in Psalm 83, is that when they pray these things, ultimately they're not simply praying that God would do all these things to deliver them, because if that was the case, it would actually be borderline or honestly selfish. But they do so asking God to intervene, intercede on their behalf so that he would get the glory is what Moses does when he intervenes to protect the people from God's anger there at the bottom of Mount Sinai. It's in essence what David did when he rose up and fought against Goliath there that day on the battlefield. Goliath had been mocking the people, but ultimately by mocking God's people, you're really mocking God himself. And David took great offense of that. And so he went out and he slew the giant, killed him, cut his head off, and marched off victoriously. Gruesome, bloody, but he did it for God's glory. And so as we look at Psalm 83, listen for those kind of clues where the people are crying out, where they're begging God to intervene, and they're asking God to do something horrible, asking God to destroy the enemy in a way that is undeniably final. Psalm number 83. Let's start at verse 1. O God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O God. So, here they are, they're in trouble, they're crying out, Oh Lord, please don't stop, don't sit back and listen. See, Lord, hear our cries and intervene. Don't hold your peace or be still. Come on, God, do something. So it's an honest, heartfelt, angst-ridden opening to a prayer. Verse 2 continues, For behold, look, is what the word behold means with an exclamation mark, for behold, your enemies, now notice this, it's not just my enemy, if it's against me because I'm representative of God and it's evil who's attacking me. So don't think in terms of Russia or China or whoever you think might be our enemies. Think in terms of evil versus righteousness. For behold, look, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They're risen up. They want to def destroy, to defeat the forces of good, those who represents God. It says in verse 3, they lay crafty plans against your people. So again, notice the connection to God. This is not just about us. It's about our relationship to God. They consult together against your treasured ones. We find that multiple times in the book of Psalms, that kind of idea of the kings of the earth coming together and conspiring against God. And so here they're conspiring against God by conspiring against God's people. They said, verse 4, Come, let us wipe them, God's people, out as a nation. Let's remove them entirely. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. Now, we live in a generation, strangely, where people are denying the Holocaust that happened in the 20th century. There's no denying it, but it serves some people's evil intentions to do so. But it's not the first time in history where people have tried to rise up and defeat and destroy God's people entirely. The Assyrians in the 700s B.C., the Babylonians in the 500 B.C.s, the Greeks, the Romans, the forces of evil in general, not just against Israel, but now, of course, we've seen through the ages against anyone who claims the name of God, anyone who attempts to live a holy and righteous life that would honor him. That's why we have lists and lists and books upon books about the martyrs who have died for their faith. And that's what he's describing here. The evil forces have come together. They want to blot out God's people to destroy his presence and thus, in their mind, prove their superiority over God himself. Verse 5 says they continue. They conspire with one accord against you. They make a covenant. They come to an agreement. 
And then he talks about various enemies that have been found throughout the Old Testament. Now, nowhere in the Old Testament do we find all these working together against Israel at one time. And so what the author here is probably doing is pulling together a list, a litany of all the known enemies that represent all the various times when people have tried to destroy God's people. And ultimately, we you know, they've been defeated over and over again, just as God promises through Jesus to the church, the gates of hell ultimately will never prevail. And so he lists various forces who've attempted to destroy God's people, Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gabel, Amnon, or Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher has joined them. They are the strong arm of the children of Lot. These are the descendants of near relatives who've all banded together at one time or another to try to rise up and destroy God because they had been left out of the covenant relationship. Now, he could have added here Assyria. He could have added Babylon. He could have added Egypt. Too many examples to list. And so he picks representatives. They've come together and they've tried to over and over destroy God's people. And so here comes the imprecation. He says there in verse 9, Do to them as you did to Midian. Gideon destroyed them. As to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmanah, who said, let us take possession for ourselves of the pastures of God. More examples of people God has defeated along the way who thought they could defeat God's people, forgetting the promise of God to Abraham. Those who bless you, I'll bless, and those who will curse you, I'll curse. It was the promise to Israel. And ultimately, as we are engrafted as Christians into the root of Jesse through Christ, as we become God's people through the new covenant, the same promise applies for us as well. And so here's what he wants them to do. Not only does he want them to be destroyed like God has done before, now he gets very specific, beginning in verse 13. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust that they blow away. Let them be like the chaff before the wind. Here's the separating the wheat from the chaff. Where the wheat is beaten against the ground, the kernels are heavy, they stay. The chaff is thrown up in the air, the wind blows it away. As the fire consumes the forest, as the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so may you pursue them with your tempest, with your storm, and you terrify them with your hurricane. Chase them. Don't merely blow them away. Chase them. Fill their faces with shame so that they may seek your name. And here's the key, folks. Here's the key to this imprecation, to see that it's about more than merely destroying the enemy. He wants God to pursue them. He wants God to attack them. But he wants to do so in a way that will bring them back to God, that they may seek your name, O Lord. It's a redemptive prayer. Let them suffer and struggle, Lord, not just to give us a break, but that they might come to you and become one with us as your people. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace. Again, sounds like the opposite of what I just said, but notice verse 18, that they may know that you alone whose name is the Lord, the covenant relationship God. May they know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, you are the most high over all the earth. And so it is a prayer about separating evil from good so that God will get the glory there in verse 18, but also with the ultimate redemptive hope that the enemy will be brought to Christ. Too often through history, Christians have lifted up prayers almost like this, where they've prayed for God to defeat the enemies, whether it was pursuing them with armies, whether burning at stakes, whether destroying their reputation, running somebody off from the church, whatever the case has been, too many times we've prayed that God would deal with our enemies because we can't, but we failed to pray that God would use the events not to crush them, but to redeem them. See, it's kind of like the picture of church discipline in the New Testament. The point of church discipline is not merely to take those who oppose you and punish them and slam them and run them off. The purpose of church discipline is like this. It's to bring them back, to restore them, to redeem them, to make them whole by bringing them back into a healthy relationship with God. Treat them like Gentiles, Jesus says, that they might see their sins and come back to him. This morning, many of you have concerns in your life, forces of evil pursuing you. Maybe it's enemies like humans. Maybe it's a neighbor or a co-worker who doesn't like you. Maybe it's a child who's wandered away, who's trying to destroy you. Maybe it's somebody who's taking and lying, 
making things up about you that are not true, trying to bring you down. It's easy for us to pray for God to destroy them, but it's a sign of proof and evidence of your heart if you'd pray that God would save them, not to make you their leader, not to make them like you, but together that God might redeem them and along with you, make them like him. May that be your prayer and may we see it with spiritual eyes when God does it all around us.